Hello, welcome. And uh, this is a bit of a change for uh, the Institute for Government because uh, normally I'm here sitting uh, chairing events about Brexit. And so it's an absolute pleasure to be talking about something uh, beyond Brexit and something beyond us uh, just sort of thinking about the UK. So we're absolutely delighted this evening to be able to welcome Senator Scott Ryan. Sen uh, Senator Ryan is the President of the Australian Senate. Um, many of you in the audience probably know loads of details about the Australian Senate and how it works. Some of you may not be so informed about the Australian Senate, but you're going to find out lots of very, very interesting things. I think you know, potentially some very interesting parallels for the UK or possible directions for reform. So Senator Ryan was elected the youngest ever President of the Senate in November 2017. It's quite interesting. We are about to have an election for the Speaker of the House of Commons here. Be interested to know about the election process. And immediately prior to this, he was Special Minister of State and Minister assisting the Prime Minister for Cabinet, which we were just having quite an interesting chat. And it turns out that involves quite a lot of what I think in other speakers called issues management, uh, aka crisis management. Uh, he's also served in various other ministerial capacities and I think was first elected to. Uh, to the Australian Parliament back in the uh, late 2000s. 2007. 2007. So he's been around in Parliament for, uh, for 12 years or now. So he, the format this evening is going to be that Senator Ryan has a speech which he's going to give, a keynote uh, on governing in an era of political disruption, view from the Australian Senate. Uh, I'm going to hear from Senator Ryan. Then I will ask a few questions. But I am very keen that you all get stuck in with lots of your questions, which can be deeply informed uh, if you're Australian, or deeply uninformed. And Senator Ryan is open for everything. Uh, I'm now going to switch to call him Scott. Anyway, That's so uh, we do that. We are tweeting from hashtag IFG Australia. Uh, so do join in the conversation on Twitter. And uh, hi to all our live stream audience back in Australia. I hope it's all going very well there. The weather looks a lot better in Melbourne a picture a friend of mine sent me this morning than it does here at the moment. So anyway, so this is Senator Ryan's last day uh, on his tour. So anyway, let's have a big welcome Thanks. and Senator Ryan. Well, thank you, Jill, and thanks for the kind introduction. Um, you can call me Scott. I'm, I'm not in a toga, so I don't insist on titles. I stopped wearing those years ago. Um, I'd like to acknowledge our High Commissioner, who actually, I think, moved my election to the Presidency of the Senate when he was Leader of the Government in the Senate two years ago. Um, democracy disputed, disrupted is a term one reads about often at the moment. I don't particularly like the term, as democracy is dynamic. One of its great strengths is to allow a society and policy to evolve. And we shouldn't mistake disruption for political parties as disruption for democracy itself. It can simply be challenging to political participants. But it is true we are going through a period of unexpected results and a potential realignment in traditional electoral coalitions. Or as I saw it described earlier this week, the potential upending of political divisions from class and economic interest to identity and place. Although personally I'm not convinced, it is worthy of discussion. Australia has experienced its fair share of unexpected political events this past decade, but these have mainly occurred within political parties. Where there is so-called broader political disruption, I contend our parliamentary arrangements provide a means to incorporate this and limit their impact. This evening I want to explain how the Australian Senate in particular strengthens the ability of our democracy to facilitate and absorb evolving democratic expectations and pressures. Second, I want to make some observations on proposals for change that have recently arisen and explain how I think they would profoundly weaken Australian democracy. Without regaling you with Australia's constitutional history, I must first outline the key difference between parliamentary arrangements in Australia and here in the UK, and that is our Senate. A detailed design by the authors of our constitution, supported at referenda that underpinned its adoption and passage in 1900, was to blend responsible government formed in the popular house with a Senate designed along United States lines, popularly elected on the same franchise as the House of Representatives, yet with staggered terms double that of the lower house with equal legislative authority, except for a restriction on initiating and amending money bills or bills imposing taxation, but with the ability to deny their passage and to effectively insist on amendments being made, and comprising equal numbers of senators from each state, regardless of population. It was not for the new Commonwealth a hereditary upper chamber, one appointed like Canada, or one elected on a restricted franchise that lacked direct democratic legitimacy. 
the Australian Senate was to be a constitutional force and its consent necessary for all legislative activity. The fact that the Constitution was designed before the great confrontation between the Lords and the Commons was undoubtedly a factor in these powers. But regardless of timing, it was one of the most contentious and difficult aspects of constitutional negotiations. So it is difficult to see how federation could have been achieved without it. All these arrangements had little impact prior to 1949, when a majoritarian winner-take-all electoral system in the Senate was replaced by proportional representation, which has, with minor changes, remained in place since then. Since then, far more often than not, a governing majority in the lower house lacks a fun functioning majority in the Senate. In the last 50 years, the government of the day has only had a notional Senate majority for eight years. This ensures negotiation, compromise and even occasional log rolling to secure passage of government initiatives. This is a defining feature of Australian politics, that while formation of government re remains strictly a matter for the House of Representatives, the implementation of a government's legislative agenda and notably even measures announced in an election manifesto or an annual budget are legislatively contested their passage is in no way guaranteed. Senate passage, therefore, usually requires the support of additional political parties or groups outside of the government itself. Why do I believe this is important? Because these arrangements limit the power of a simple majority in one House of Parliament, usually formed by one side of politics. The Senate guarantees the consideration of additional voices in the legislative process, as, more often than not, the support of either the opposition or minor parties is necessary. In an era where lower political party identification amongst voters appears to be a long-term trend, this is important in maintaining democratic legitimacy and consent, and limiting the risk of interests and experiences not being heard, leading to further frustration and disenchantment with democracy and government itself. Voting patterns illustrate how the expectations of our citizens in this regard have also changed and how our parliament has responded. Every Australian receives two ballots one for the House of Representatives constituency and one for the statewide Senate election. The second vote for the Senate is consciously used by a substantial number of Australians to vote differently in these two elections, and this has been the case for decades. A simple way of considering this is the difference between the combined vote for my side of politics, the Liberal National Coalition, and Labor between the House and the Senate. In 2019, the two major parties received 8% less of the vote in the Senate than they did in the House of Representatives people vote differently. Looking back, this is approximately the same percentage as when Bob Hawke came to power in 1983, when it was 7.6%, and even as far back as 1972, when the difference was 9.8%. This difference in voting between the House of Representatives and the Senate has varied at particular elections, but remained along this trend over time, alongside a sustained increase in minor party vote share in both houses in recent years. Again, a simple figure illustrates this. Approximately one in five voters cast their Senate vote for a minor party in 2007. But at the most recent election in May 2019, minor parties made up a third of all Senate votes. This fragmentation is a long-term trend, and our parliamentary system provides an outlet for it through these, through these two ballots for two chambers. Even when close elections see stable governments formed in the lower house, without independents or smaller parties holding the very existence of government, existence of government to ransom, Yet the legislative activity of governments is limited by the Senate even when they are secure in office. A role for other voices is guaranteed in the work of government while the voice of the majority forms it. While this may frustrate some governments, with one Prime Minister quipping once that they were in office but not in power, it is also important to note the requirement for Senate consent can also be a means to hold government to a mandate. For example, holding governments to promises not to do things. One historic criticism of our Senate, however, has been that the population variation between states represents a major malapportionment and therefore unfairness, given that New South Wales receives the same number of senators as Tasmania with 15 times the population. There is no way around this, it's true. It was the historic compromise to deliver federation of the colonies into the Commonwealth. But interestingly, through the electoral system employed in the Senate, it does a very good job of representing voting results when considered nationally it is a relatively proportional chamber when the national vote is considered absent state boundaries. Indeed, in our current Senate, no party has an overall majority. Nearly a fifth of senators come from outside the two major parties, and all parties that received over 3 per cent of the national vote have elected representatives. To me, these features give the Senate a great deal of democratic legitimacy in the legislative process. Similarly, the composition of the Senate has changed, reflecting changing voting patterns as various minor parties have come and gone in recent decades, 
notably the replacement of the Australian Democrats by the Australian Greens as the largest minor party. And in particular, by giving minority and emerging voices and non-major parties a direct role in the legislative process, it contains the frustration that may see disenchantment or even anger when people feel they are not being heard or their interests and experiences are not being represented. Now, if I could turn to some proposed changes to the Senate that have been put up in Australia recently. Proposals to dumble the Senate are almost as old as the Australian Constitution. The Labor Party for many years wanted it abolished or its powers restricted. At one point, even members of the Liberal Party floated the prospect of allowing the Senate to be effectively overridden by the House of Representatives via a joint sitting of the Houses without an intervening election. However, both of these would require a referendum, and given that it would have no chance whatsoever, they've never been attempted. Even those proposing it, I observe often frustrated executives in the House of Representatives, realise the public would not support the removal or otherwise reduction in the importance of their second vote for the Senate, the one they use to hold governments accountable. But recently another proposal has arisen to remove the statewide election of senators and therefore remove the proportionality of the Senate that has been so fundamental to it since 1949 and I contend a reason for the Senate's popular support as a check on government. One of these proposals by former Deputy Prime Minister goes as far as to suggest further mass malapportionment of the Senate by breaking states up into electoral regions geographically, providing capital cities of each state with two senators and the other ten to the regions, disregarding population distribution within the state. To be specific, it would mean that rather than just variances in populations between the states, it would also ensure massive variance, variations in populations within states electing individual senators. As I outlined, I outlined earlier, the current Senate is actually very reflective of the national vote, despite the difference in state populations. This proposal would destroy that. Indeed, the consequences would be the, the elimination of most minority voices and parties, as well as dramatically reducing the value of urban voters in the election of senators. In essence, if you live in regional or rural areas, you would have a greater say in the formation of the Senate and therefore passage of legislation. One justification by proponents is we already have these variations, but I believe this should be disregarded because of the figures I outlined above, illustrating that the Senate is relatively reflective of the national vote despite the state election of senators. This proposal intends to eliminate that on the basis that some voters should have a special claim simply based on where they live. A stated justification for that, this, is that too many senators are based in capital cities and the regions are underrepresented. Now, before I tackle that assumption, it is important we note the numbers. It is true that three in four senators are based in capital cities, but it turns out that so are three in five Australians. So the imbalance is not as severe as can be implied. However, this proposal is also based on a misconceived notion that the only criteria that matters is geography. But that specific experience, attribute or perspective, which I do not at all dismiss, is also overlaid by others, such as personal interest, cultural and personal identity, employment, to name just a few, just as in the past, class or religion might have been more defining elements. I don't dismiss the notion that many Australians, and particularly those in regional areas that are feeling the brunt of natural, uh, natural disasters or tragedy, economic adjustment or simple access to government services, may feel disconnected from their politicians and government. But why should an unemployed person on the peri-urban fringe be stripped of the value of their Senate vote at the expense of a business owner in a regional centre? I cannot see the claim to fairness in this. Disadvantage, lack of access to services, frustration at not being heard or disconnectedness is not solely defined by geography. The idea that to deal with frustration and disenchantment we would strip some Australians of the value of their vote is not only wrong in principle, but it would be completely counterproductive in dealing with disenfranchisement and frustration by elevating some Australians over others. Now, Like most old democracies, Australia has had a history of the politicised design of electorates, but thankfully we have eliminated this in recent decades. Australians will rightly not tolerate changes to electoral systems that are designed to achieve particular outcomes or favour particular voices or parties or interests. This proposal is explicitly intended to elevate some voters at the expense of others, and an unavoidable consequence is the elimination of minor parties whose support is geographically dispersed. This will be seen for what it is, fiddling with an electoral system, a preference for certain in interests and in citizens over others, designed to deliver a specific electoral outcome favouring one or more parties and that will eliminate minority voices. Specifically, the proposal to limit our capital cities to two senators represents not just an attempt to deliver a particular electoral outcome, it says the issues of urban life, 
are less valid than those elsewhere. And that would be immediately apparent, further feeding frustrations amongst millions of Australians. I believe it would also inevitably impact the legitimacy of the Senate, and therefore the Parliament itself, by reducing its ability to incorporate the interests of minority voices as I've described above. The legitimate concern that geographic size increases the difficulty of representing constituents can and should be dealt with by extra resources, which we already do and, if appropriate, we can increase. They are not dealt with by saying a regional vote is worth more than an urban one. In conclusion, having been in opposition and government, a minister and a backbencher, I've experienced all aspects of the role of the Senate. It can be frustrating to have proposals you firmly believe in the, are in the national interest blocked, or you can stop a proposal you passionately believe is a small one, a poor one. It can provide opportunities for some to extract commitments on unrelated issues. It can require frustrating, imperfect compromise. But it works by ensuring more voices than just my own, that a greater range of experiences and perspectives are taken into account in the legislative process. This strengthens it. This delivers greater legitimacy and, in my view, assists with maintaining democratic consent. It doesn't need to be disrupted. Thank you. So it's a very interesting debate. You mentioned at the start, Scott, that, that you know, politics was moving from sort of normal class-based things to much more identity. Now, we know here in the UK what our big current identity cleavage is uh, and the weakening of, uh, of traditional party loyalties now replaced by how do you identify as leave or remain. So is urban-rural now the big sort of identifier in... Australia, or, or what is this sort of identity cleavage in Australia? Because we think of Australia as sort of, you know, basically quite classless and everybody basically on the beach, but yeah, um, be a bit of a parody there. But look, it, it's one of the different experiences that people have that mm. defines um, their perspective on, mm. on voting on a whole range of issues. I mean, if you live on the urban fringe and you are a commuter into the CBD, you, mm. you're going to have a very different lived experience of population, population mm. growth and infrastructure mm. challenges than you will if you live in the inner city. Um, personally, I think the rural-urban divide has grown in Australia in recent years. Um, I put that down, and this is purely anecdotal, to the fact that two generations ago, a lot of Australians had more family on the land or more close experience with people who had worked in regional areas. We've always been a very highly urbanised society, and there's always been a trend of people to move to the large cities. Uh, our large cities do dominate the, 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 their respective states. Uh, so I would say it is one. Um, I think it has got bigger in recent mm. years, but I wouldn't say it's the defining. One observation I would make, though, is a lot of our lower socioeconomic electorates are actually in regional areas and are held by the National Party, mm. which is the Conservative <coughs> Coalition partner mm. of the Liberal Party mm. of Australia. So um, socioeconomic status mm. has not always been defined by, for example, what some people assume is a Labor, mm. Liberal or Conservative divide. Now that's that's uh, very interesting. So the big force behind this sort of reform proposal that you uh, you think is uh, is sort of you know not justified, not a good thing. What's the big driver behind it? What's what's uh, what problem is it perceived to be addressing in the Senate? Um, well, I don't like to speak on behalf of others. You can actually look up the proposal. Yeah. It's by um, um, the former Deputy Prime Minister, Barnaby Joyce. He, mm. He's made a formal submission to a, the Electoral Matters Committee. It's online. You can read it. So yeah. it, um, I don't want to necessarily speak on his behalf. But it, he expresses a frustration that uh, with most senators based in capital cities, mm. uh, that regions aren't being represented. I think that's the fairest way to mm. summarise his frustration. But it's there for everyone to read. So who decides, uh, you know, so as I understand it, we have alternative voting for the House of Representatives, we'll come on to that in a bit, and you have uh, what we understand is sort of more obvious proportional representation, mm. SDV, for that. So who gets to decide who stands for the Senate for a party? Is this, you know, one of the things that people in the UK always say, if you go for party lists, basically, you don't have that connection between voters and the person representing them, and you basically are handing over representation to party bureaucrats because they do that. So, you know, is this a sort of second best way of dealing with the fact that actually they're putting the wrong people, if you like it from Mr. Joyce's point of view? Are the wrong people getting onto those lists? Uh, well, I'll let others judge whether, I mean, it's a bit like for a politician to judge whether the wrong people are getting on the list because I'm one of them. Um, 
Uh, so every party does it differently. Yeah. The Greens essentially win one senator in each state. They have their own internal yeah. processes. Labor has those. Um, my party, the Liberal Party, uh, does it differently in each state, but in most states it's probably a convention of somewhere yeah. between three and six hundred people, sometimes more, mm -hmm. electing uh, in, in an internal competition the people mm -hmm. that go onto the party list. Now I'm very intrigued by it. So we've always heard, so I'm going to make this a bit more UK-ish mm -hmm. briefly, um, we obviously have the House of Lords, which is quite different in terms of why it's there and who's in it, with its sort of distinct pluses and minuses. But you said that the Senate feels that it can block proposals, force compromise or whatever, so it has a sort of different sort of legitimacy to the House of Lords, because mm. the House of Lords certainly doesn't block uh, manifesto commitments under a thing called the Salisbury Convention. Mm. Um, so how do these two different sort of systems work? You said people vote differently because they know that their vote's going to be used differently in that. So in the, uh, have different impacts because of the different way they're elected. So I'm just sort of quite intrigued as to whether there's general sort of acceptance in Australia that AV for one house and STV makes sense because it sounds like the sort of thing someone might slightly dream up in some sort of, you know, great big... Mm. Constitutional Convention, quite a bit. People would sort of say, "Well, why on earth do we do that? You know, actually, you've got a better proportional system here, so why do we accept the mm. sort of less good proportional system?" But you think this is quite a sensible balance of Pers my, my personal view, and people might not be surprised. I'm a senator, of course, I'll defend the Senate. Um, uh, it's a historic compromise. It was necessary for the, for the colonies to federate and become the Commonwealth mm. of Australia. So we're all a product of you know events mm. that have led us to where we are. Um, the Issue, I, I, the reason I think it works well is I, I am not a strong believer in proportional systems to form government. Um, I believe that that then means that promises made before an election, which can all be negotiated away afterwards to form coalitions mm. to get to a majority, um, lack legitimacy. Mm. Um, that's a personal view. Um, however, I like the view that we provide that, that, that minority voice that need to um, negotiate and that check on a, on a majoritarian lower house uh, in the Senate. Mm. Um, and there is no assumption in Australia that the passage of legislation, once it goes through the House of Representatives, will automatically go through the Senate. Um, there is no assumption whatever. Um, it needs consent of the Senate. Uh, the Senate is quite willing to mm. and has always claimed its right to because it is directly elected on the same franchise. Uh, it's not a, never been a restricted franchise, unlike some of our state mm. upper chambers um, or other chambers in the world, like the Irish upper house, mm. for example. Um, it's always been a co-equal legislative partner. So there's never been an assumption that anything you announce will automatically get through the Senate. Mm. You do need to get the majority, 39 or 76. And people recognise, because I know one of the concerns here is if we elected the House of Lords on a different, more proportional mm. franchise, that, that would, people say that would undermine the legitimacy of our House of Commons. Maybe it's because first past the post is so much less legitimate than, than AV, I don't know. But people are worried that you get into a sort of competition if we had two elected chambers, but actually this sort of works out okay in Australia, you sort of, you know. Well, my view is, is that it does. There are plenty of people who prefer the approach, mm. um, and historically the one side of politics did prefer yeah. that and wanted a majoritarian mm. single chamber. Mm. Um, but if you believe in, you know, structural checks and balances mm. on the power mm. of even a, temp of a majority, because by definition they're always temporary, or you see the Senate as, or you, you think another chamber is handy as a break on the executive, um, that's a, as much a value, reflection of your values, and I, I tend to like that. Um, we also have um, compulsory voting, which ensures, in my view, um, that you don't get, we don't get turnout issues. We get 90% of people plus turning out to vote on election day or in the lead up to it. Mm. So therefore, there's that direct mandate. Um, and it's frustrating when you're a minister. Uh, it provides opportunities mm. when you're in opposition, but I think in the end, it provides for more people to have a voice and therefore a greater opportunity for acquiescence or consent on sometimes difficult measures. So when we were debating, we, we had a referendum back here mm. in, uh, in 2011, I think, looks maybe 2012, uh, on introducing alternative vote, and everybody said actually this is sort of bad PR, and you basically get the sort of lowest common denominator, you know, the candidate people dislike least rather than the sort of preferred candidate emerging. So how, you know, do people in Australia think actually AV gives us the people that we want, you know, rather than just, uh, you know, who can we put up with and I'll give him my second or third preference as I go down the list, uh, him or her, of course. Mm. Uh, 
do people see that with AV in Australia? Or do it, they... it, it's been in place for so long, it's not, it, it would be odd to have something different. A couple of our states have trialled uh, what we call optional yeah. preferential, where you can vote first past the post. I think it's only in place in New South Wales now. Mm. Um, so everyone's very familiar with it. It's not, it's not contentious. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't suggest that any electoral system produces politicians people love. Um, one might say that it's always the least unpreferred. Um, but our voting system, by forcing people to number every box, does say to the voter, firstly, you do need to choose between who's going to form government. You need to engage um, with, you know, it's not always Liberal and Labor, but in most electoral contests it is. One of them is likely to form the government. The voter needs to choose by issuing a preference whether it's their least unpreferred or their most preferred. So it does do that. Uh, and I think that is important. The other thing it does is it means that where we have, like we get about 43% of the vote at an election we just won. Um, the Labor Party got a lot less, I think it got just under 33. Um, what it means though is that if that was done proportionally there would be other parties like in our Senate that would be deciding who the Prime Minister was. Um, we actually effectively through alternative <coughs> voting or preferential voting force that decision down to the voter. Mm which I think means that you get the combination of predictable stable government in the lower house without it having the ability to legislate at will. The other thing that is very different to the UK is our level of party discipline. In Australia we have party discipline that is the highest for pretty much that I'm aware of in the Western world, uh, particularly in a Westminster style parliamentary democracy. Uh, it started more than a century ago where the Labor movement introduced what is called the pledge. Mm. And if you are elected as a candidate for the Australian Labor Party, you have to sign effectively, the ple take the pledge, which is that you will always vote in line with caucus decisions, the majority, which is done by internal majority. And if you don't do that, you will lose your disendorsement virtually automatically and you won't be in Parliament much longer. I think some of the whips uh, in the UK Parliament might be, uh, might be seeing some merits in that at the moment. Just a final question uh, for me before we go to the floor. So be thinking of your questions, because I know you all know much more about Australian politics than me. Um, you mentioned that if they're constitutional change, they have to go to referendums, mm. and obviously you've had referend most notorious Australian referendums, of course, is the one where you chose to, uh, to keep the Queen as your head of state, um, choice never offered to people over here. Um, but I'm just interested, <laughs> she said, I just always say that to Australian friends of mine. Um, <laughs> I was just sort of wondering, what's your experience of referendums? We're obviously living with the fallout mm. from perhaps not the best designed referendum three and a quarter years ago. And I just wondered, you know, reflecting on Australia's experience of referendums, what you, uh, what you might have I, as advice to future British Prime Ministers thinking about referendums. I haven't had a lot of experience. There was a group of referenda in 1977, mm. um, most of which were uncontentious, three of which succeeded. Um, and they were very <laughs> non-contentious issues. In 1988, four contentious proposals were put up. They only got under 40% of the vote. Mm. Then we had the two in 1999 mm. uh, about a preamble to the Constitution and changing um, the head of state. I wouldn't... I, I think this is an important point to go to what I'll try mm. and explain. We didn't vote necessarily to keep um, the Queen. We voted to not change the Constitution. We voted to not adopt a model that was put forward. And it, when we have constitutional referenda, they are referenda on a, a specific change. There is a bill that goes through mm. Parliament. That bill literally says if this goes to a referendum where it needs a national majority and a majority in at least four states, uh, then the constitution will be changed in exactly mm. these terms to the comma. Mm. Now, that means that by nature it's very different to a referendum on a, on, on a principle or um, on a broad question. Now, we don't have a very good record of success in Australia on these. You know, um, of the 44, 36 have failed. Um, of the 36 that failed, only two failed because they didn't receive a majority of states, mm. but they did get a national majority. Mm. 34 failed both hurdles. But overwhelmingly, there have been proposals mm. to centralise more power mm. in Canberra, the national government, or to you know, um, change the institutions, like have four-year mm. terms or fixed mm. parliaments. We probably won't get that idea again for a while. I've never been a supporter of it. But, um, and so people say the Australian Constitution's mm. been hard to change. Well, the people have voted against it. It's like a politician complaining about an election result. We give our people a direct say. I don't think it's a bad mm. thing. I think most of the changes were terrible yeah. ideas. Um, but one of the reasons, for example, in 1999 that the Republic referendum failed was substantial numbers of Republicans voted against it because of the model of selecting the president mm. that was going to be given to politicians. Um, and I'll put myself in that category. Yeah. Okay, that's really, really interesting. Let's go to the floor. Now, I think Sarah is... Uh
is going to wander around with a mic. So it's very important because we're hoping we're getting lots of people watching in Australia. So we definitely want you to do it. Let's, uh, let's go to the back there and then everybody will then pass it along to whatever. We'll t take questions individually, I think. It's one of the big pluses. Oh, uh, Tell us who you are. Uh, Scott Simmons from the Taxpayers Alliance. Um, I happen to agree with you, um, Mr Ryan, about everything you've said, really. I think it's a, it's a great model for government. Um, do you think um, that's why they have such a big um, problem in the UK is if, if, you, if you then restrict minor parties, you then get more and more people into the main parties and then that causes more problems than it solves. Um, I was just wondering your opinion on that. Can I say it? Firstly, I'm reluctant in my office to provide commentaries on other countries' yeah. arrangements. What I'll say is, would I, would I like a first-past-the-post system with only a single house of representatives in Australia? No, I wouldn't, and here are multiple reasons why. The ones I mentioned. Um, we always talk in Australia of uh, the two-party preferred vote, so we always tend to talk at 52, 48, 53, 47. Personally, I think, to a lot of voters who don't follow politics a great deal, that sounds a lot better than people winning on 38 per cent of the vote. Um, it also reduces the incentive for people to um, have breakaway parties that might just suppress mm. one person's vote by taking the vote away from one party, which means another party that might historically have come second leapfrogs, even though it got no more votes, it's just that the other party votes split. Mm. Our preferential voting, or um, mm. alternative voting in the lower house, means that those votes still count. Um, one criticism of it is, of course, that comes, I think, from the US, is that it gives those people two votes. You know, if you vote for a minor party and they don't get elected, why should you get a second vote? We have a prefer We seek mm. the, the most preferred candidate. We don't seek the most popular candidate. Mm. Um, so I think that if we didn't have that, that the pressures we, ha we, we have, and we may well have, with different um, experiences, rural and urban, growing, um, I think we're getting a more geographic concentration of disadvantage in a number of areas. Um, Partly it could be a product of house prices, there's a whole range of reasons. Um, I think we would lead to more disenchantment and more frustration um, because people would then feel that their interests weren't being represented, their experiences weren't being represented. They don't follow every vote in Parliament. Um, you know, that's the blessing of a successful liberal democracy. People don't have to follow every vote in Parliament. But they do look for proxies and surrogates. Is someone who's got my life experience, is someone who has got um, you know, my particular values got a voice in that place, and, and I think our Senate guarantees that. And it's frustrating when you're in government, but it does lead, in my view, to a more sustainable um, model. So, Scott, could you give us an example of one of a place where a minority party, because it's in the Senate, has actually changed the course of a piece of legislation? Is there a sort of recent example that you might point to of saying, if there hadn't been Greens or hadn't been you know, this party represented in the Senate, uh, actually, this wouldn't have happened. Um, well, we recently, with budget measures, you know, we, we we've made unrelated commitments on a particular mm. uh, tax bill to have an inquiry into a certain matter that was an interest mm. of one senator. Uh, we've made arrangements in the last parliament, I think, to change procurement details to support local industry mm. in order to get an unrelated bill through parliament. Um, sometimes um, it will be support for a senator's an activity in a senator's mm. state. You know, that, uh, to deal with a disadvantaged area. Um, one senator at the moment, I think it was an increase, we, we've got before the parliament an issue around having a, a trial of uh, managed welfare payments um, mm. on a card to um, limit the purpose mm. for which they can be used. And one senator is saying, well, uh, no, sorry, it's actually about drug testing yeah. uh, with that. And one senator is saying, well, I want increased support for drug services, mm. for rehabilitation services before I consider that. So sometimes they're related, sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're very big issues, sometimes they're not. We famously got some substantial changes to our age pension through the Senate, which involved a redistribution from people well off mm. to people not well off, and that got through with the Greens mm. support in um, two parliament, last parliament. Um, so it, it means that you have different pathways when you're mm. in government to negotiate with different parties about your priorities. And do, does the sort of, you know, majority government in the, in the House of Representatives, does it negotiate as well with the sort of main opposition party in the Senate, or is it really just trying to sort of cobble together, you know, the sort of minority parties to come in? Well, you know, we've had, ironically, from before 2010, the only time we'd had a single seat majority mm. in our 150-person mm. parliament, basically, was 1961. Mm. 
And in 2010, 2016 and now, we have a government with a single seat mm. majority. So we've had three of the closest four mm. elections um, in the last 50 mm. years. Um, but there will be other issues upon which mm. we deal with the main opposition party. One of those has been national security laws, which our mm. High Commissioner was um, responsible for uh, when he was our Attorney General. And we do, for example, undertake with the, the Labor Party opposition, as we were with mm. them when we were in opposition, um, substantial negotiation mm. and discussions with them about those laws. Okay, um, next. Yes, if you might, Sarah, so get the microphone. I just thought that was quicker. Yes. Sure. Uh, Matthew Lesh uh, of the Adam Smith Institute over here, but also the IPA in Australia. Uh, thank you very much for your comments. I think they were uh, fascinating and correct, and especially uh, the sense in which I think the most important point you potentially made um, is that trying to split urban from rural, it, rural is actually nonsensical, particularly when inner urban and outer urban is so fundamentally different to begin with, um, and they're completely different experiences. Um, I kind of though interested if you could unpack a little bit more the impact of party discipline in Australia. Um, I think that's something that really makes uh, both the Australian representative, uh, the House representatives, and the Senate quite distinctive um, in their operation. Particularly if you, can, for example, compare. Um, so I know you're a great student of the American Senate, which has a very independent senators. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, do you think that it's it's a it's a feature or a bug? Um, and would, would you like to see more or less party discipline? Um, and second to that, if, if we wanted less party discipline, I'd be keen for your view on the idea of doubling the size of the House of Representatives, for example, as a way of uh, ensuring that there's more independent members who aren't necessarily just working to get onto the front bench, which I think is often the experience in the Australian House of Representatives. The Australian House of Representatives is quite small. I mean, even when you look at proportional shares, you know, um, ratio to population, is it? It's sort of, you know, ours is 650 for a population of 65 million. You're, um, 150 for 25 million. Yeah, so that's quite... So our House of Representatives and Senate are set by formula. The Senate has to be half the size of the House of Representatives mm. because of an obscure provision that's only been used once in history, which is mm. if a government's legislation gets blocked yeah. and meets certain conditions, the, the government can dissolve both Houses of Parliament, mm. so not just half the Senate. Yeah. And then if it wins, it can present that legislation to a sitting of both Houses. And of course, there being double the number of members of House, if you get a comfortable yeah. majority, you can override yeah. the Senate's objection. That's only happened once in 1974. But it means that to expand the House of Representatives, you have to expand the Senate by half the size. Um, party discipline in Australia, in my view, historically effectively flows from Labor's pledge. It was a very early pledge, and it was actually quite contentious even on some within the Labor movement. And it has been a defining feature of my side of politics to never insist on that. We have the right on any bill, as long as you're not a minister uh, or a whip, to cross the floor, so to speak, and vote against government legislation or whatever the government may decide on an amendment. Um, it doesn't happen often, mm. um, uh, and you know I, you wouldn't want to do it too often because your party selectors and party members mm. would ask you why. I personally, you know, I've got a pretty Burkean view of these mm. things. I think that's particularly important. Mm. Um, I don't know if that'll ever change in Australia. Uh, one of the reasons, ironically, is despite the Senate being elected on a party list system, mm. the Senate has historically had more independence from the party line than has the House. Mm. Not in recent years, but for some of those years I mentioned um, between 1977 and uh, 1975 and 1980, when the then Fraser Liberal Coalition government had a Senate majority, it was described at the time as uh, a majority on most days at most times. But mm. there were occasions where half a dozen senators would cross the floor and defeat government legislation. And did they find themselves on the list next time round, or because um, I think yeah, that would I, be the assumption would be they might just drop off suddenly no, and. Okay. There are a couple of people who, who did it too often, um, some said, and before, well before my time um, weren't re-endorsed, but it was a decision of party members. Um, but no, generally not. Now, it's tightened in recent years, I'll be honest, uh, but it is still something that is a difference between the two parties. And again, I, I don't want to make a judgement. I'm obviously a Liberal and I prefer our yeah. approach, but uh, I don't think it will change in Australia any time so soon. So the other thing, though, apart from party discipline that fascinates us over here about Australia is the frequency with which the parties spill the Prime Minister or their leader, because that really, uh, having done lots of ABC of trying to mm. explain why Theresa May was still Prime Minister, uh, when in Australia she'd have been sort of gone ages before. Uh, you know, do, are people relaxed about that in Australia? I mean, it's slightly tightening up now, isn't it? It's yeah. slightly harder um, to get rid of the Prime Minister and discover, you know, Malcolm Turnbull's Prime Minister on the Monday and then has gone by the Wednesday or yeah. whatever happened in the most recent spill. Um, it did cause community angst, um, particularly on some occasions. Um, 
but both parties have now changed their processes, so it effectively can't happen the same way. Um, up until a few years ago, essentially both parties had a system whereby um, someone could move that the leadership positions be declared vacant in a party room mm -hmm. meeting, um, and essentially within a week a pe meeting mm -hmm. would be called, and then you'd have an election if that motion got up and positions mm -hmm. were declared vacant. Um, and I think we're, we've gone past that now. Mm -hmm. Parties have changed their rules, and I think most politicians um, including myself, and I, mm. I, I, I was in a lot of party room ballots for mm. leader, um, you know, know that it's not something that you do lightly. And do the Senate get to choose yeah, so the our, leader? Is, you get to choose all as well? Senators on both sides are full members of the party caucus on the Labor side and the party room on the Liberal side. So I sit in the party room with members of the House mm. of Representatives where we decide you know, government yeah. policy and legislative priorities. Oh, right. I didn't know that. Okay, we've got some more questions. Yes, we'll go there and then we'll, we'll get to everybody, don't worry. Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Claire Wesley. I work at Portland Communications um, and uh, until April I worked in Australian politics. Um, I suppose my question is, uh, you've made a very convincing defence of the constitution of the Australian Senate, but I do wonder if because the balance of power um, in particular recently has often rested with um, a few people who some may suggest might be a bit particular or uh, unusual in their views, they can hold disproportionate sway with regard to what legislation, um, well, the shape of the legislation, uh, and that, that goes on behind closed doors often. Um, but also, there may be bills and policy that uh, it's decided in the party room or in the cabinet room that there's no point in even bringing such legislation because it would never make it past the, you know, the kingmakers of the upper house. Um, that could be argued to be a bit perverse or slightly undemocratic. Uh, I just wondered what your response to that is. So one of the changes I mentioned, we did, we did have a situation which the, with the way the ballot was drawn and the yeah. way it was counted that allowed people to get elected on as little as half a percent of the vote because of gaming of preferences. Mm -hmm. Now, we essentially changed that so voters couldn't just number a box and the votes could then be preferenced by parties right across 70 or 80 candidates. Voters now have to number the box themselves. So that did change the results from that 2016 election where um, some people got elected on very low margins. And I think in 2010 the record was at 1.6% of the vote got a senator elected. Um, so the proportionality um, is generally maintained and the ballot paper is the same. Um, the other point, observation I'd make, though, is remember minor parties only matter if the government and the opposition don't agree. You know, and, and so um, the question I ask myself is, should a, a, an executive, which has the right to initiate legislation in our um, uh, system, as does the parliament, by the way, but not on financial matters, um, should it have, because a cabinet or a government party room decides it wants to legislate a certain priority, should it actually have the right to legislate that, or should some process of consent be required? I tend to fall on the latter side. I don't think by virtue of being in government you, you, you necessarily have the right to legislate on any matter you think fit. The challenge we've had in Australia, and I did speak about this last yeah. year, how could we adopt the Salisbury Convention mm. in Australia um, to actually say, well, something that was central to a mandate, you know, could that be um, respected? So we had two great examples on my side of politics, where John Howard took a tax reform package to the election in 1998. Uh, Labor would not support it, even though he won the election. We had to negotiate it with the then Australian Democrats, the centrist mm. sort of middle of the um, cross bench party, and we had to change it. And it ended up being different to what mm. we'd taken to the election. The other one was in 2013, the single most central issue in that campaign when Tony Abbott mm. won was the repeal of the carbon tax that had been introduced by um, under mm. Julia Gillard with the support of the Greens. Um, it was highly contentious. Our proposal was to repeal it um, and we couldn't repeal it because the Senate um, opposed it until the Senate composition changed and it changed several months after an election. And so that made me think, and I'm sure that Labor Party's got examples they could say where I've done the opposite by the way, so I'm not claiming to have a halo, that can we come up with an understanding between the parties whereby something that is not just expressed in general terms but a very specific commitment um, is actually respected. Now, that's purely my proposal. I don't think it's necessarily got anywhere. Mm. But I do think that is the one risk we have. Elections have mm. to matter. And therefore, if something is detailed, costed, and mm. the focus of an election campaign, and not just five mm. weeks, but potentially for months leading up it, I think the system does suffer if a government can't bring that policy in. So how explicit are the mandates? Because I remember the former cabinet secretary sitting 
on this table after the, uh, I think the 2015 election, maybe, whatever, and saying that the civil service had done its job, gone through the manifestos, is what we call them, mm. um, and counted 570 uh, commitments in the Conservative manifesto that they were then trying to, uh, to implement. If you asked a voter, and they could m maybe name more than mm. three, that would be a very informed voter who was not employed as a civil servant. So how far would that go? I mean, I don't know how different your, maybe there are you know, models of brevity and just a couple of things, but, um, but people put an awful lot in manifestos for very strange reasons here, uh, just to pacify a little mm. bit of the party or whatever. And most MPs won't know most of the stuff that's in their manifesto. We don't have a single manifesto, so there's no manifesto, so to speak. Uh, policies will be released yeah. by oppositions yeah. and governments in the lead up to an election, yeah. sometimes a year before an election. Yeah. Um, one thing we do a lot of is we spend a lot of time putting work into and then debating costings of yeah. policies. And we have an independent parliamentary mm. budget office now. Mm. And so the first question our media colleagues mm. here tonight yeah. would ask me if I was announcing mm. a policy tonight would be, well, what are the costings over the mm. forward estimates? Um, and they are quite precise. I mean, I, there aren't many countries in the world that debate costings around mm. policy the way we do. Mm. But the initiatives the government or the opposition announces, it's really up to them. Mm. And they will choose what to release, when to release it. Um, and some of it will be six months before an election, like with John Howland's um, tax reform package. Mm. Some of it might be three weeks before an election. So um, the 570 yeah, below the radar pledges, that's, that's no, not the, a feature the, of Australian the, elections. The, the public service, as we call them, you know, they will yeah. work up uh, with what we call our red and blue books. Yeah. Um, a, a, an implementation plan for all the promises yeah. they've sort of kept track of for both yeah. sides. Um, but, but there's not a single document um, and there's not one thing that sort of has a special status in the way that I, I gather over here a manifesto does. So somewhere on the Institute for Government website you can find a study of the Australian Parliamentary Budget Office which we think is quite a good thing. So anyway, yes at the back. Thank you. Nick Herbert, MP for Arundel and South Downs. Uh, Senator, we we used to feel a little bit superior uh, about our system here because we thought that in recent history you'd been turning over your prime ministers a little too often. Uh, but in the last three years, we've uh, followed suit. And I wondered if you thought that the turbulence that you've had over the last few years uh, owed more to politics than to the system and whether you think it's over. Uh, because people here are hopeful that our current turbulence is more to do with one political mm. issue and less to do with uh, our system? Or is this a, a change that uh, we're beginning to see because of the rise of populist politics? Well, as I said, both parties have changed rules um, you know, in Australia, so I don't think we'll go through that period again. Uh, obviously, with the election result on May 19, I really hope we don't go through it again because you know, we, we, we won by one seat. Um, what I would also say, though, is that, at least in my observation of Australian history, again, purely personal view and not scientific, where you have major economic adjustments um, or major social adjustments, you can have sort of, not a fraying, but a need to readjust what I'll call a governing consensus. And if you look at what happened in the 1970s, you'd had pretty radical social change, um, and I don't mean that in a pejorative fashion, in the 60s. Um, you had the oil price shock, the breakdown of the, the, the post-war economic model. And Australia had a period of instability. We had Robert Menzies retire, um, Harold Holt um, drown, um, John Gorton vote against himself, use his casting vote against himself in a party room ballot because it was tied. William McMahon lost an election and Gough Whitlam had the constitutional crisis and was dismissed. It was a period that compared to the previous um, you know, 16 years of one single prime minister was quite you know, relatively unstable. In reflection, I think we may look back at what happened in the late 2000s with what we call the global financial crisis, which you know um, has led, which hit Australia differently to Europe, I understand, and, and North America. But it is clear there's an economic adjustment going on. We, I can see that in the regions in particular. Um, manufacturing industries having closed down because of um, various, you know, not competitive, um, uh, the rise of other manufacturing economies. Um, I think is I ask myself is part of the instability that's happening in a few places a product of again some of those things that are changing underneath the water level is society changing different expectations that's my personal view I've got no evidence to support it but I just sense that a number of the things that my generation I'm 46 came took for granted uh, for example commitment 
free trade was always good because it left consumers better off. It led to a more efficient allocation of resources. Um, that we were more concerned with everyone real wage growth rather than um, where it was going. And I get the sense that some of those values might be changing and politics sometimes takes a while to adjust. Now, we'll wait and see, but that's a purely a personal view. Okay. Yes, um, let's come down to the front, Sarah. What's the room? Yes. Okay. Senator Richard Ferguson from The Australian, thanks so much for your speech. Um, on your theme of regional representation, some of your colleagues have argued that instead of Barnaby Joyce's proposal, the basically pre-selections um, within the parties for people who are not from Australia, um, basically have a model of regional representation. It's obviously been a big um, part of the recent pre-selection fight between um, Sarah Henderson and um, Greg Mirabella in your own state branch. Um, should the Liberal Party have regional representation quotas in its Senate pre-selections, or are you against that as well? Um, well, in principle, what the parties do is you know, not a matter that I think I wasn't addressing that in a matter of parties. Um, I think it would be different in different states. I mean, okay, Queensland's a very decentralised state, uh, where, whereas without dismissing the different experience of people outside Melbourne, I, I take the observation before, life on the outer skirts of Melbourne, um, in honesty, would have more in common in many ways than life in some of, in some of our large regional centres than it would in the inner city of Melbourne. So I'm not convinced. I, I do think that the wisdom of crowds works here. Um, the Liberal Party members can be trusted to make those judgments, and that is something they do take into account, the one you mentioned. Um, in other states, I know they do divide it up for their state upper houses to ensure people come from different regions. Uh, so, look, I think that, in purely for speaking on behalf of the Victorian, speaking as a member of the Victorian division of the Liberal Party, not on behalf of it, um, I don't think we need to. Uh, the party members will decide if they think it's important. Okay, let's go back. Uh, my name's Oliver Madison. Uh, you mentioned that the electoral system for the Australian Senate is effectively one of the party lists, although obviously technically it is STV. Mm. But that, as you know, is to do with <coughs> the uh, prevalence of above-the-line voting. Uh, how does that affect the um, degree of uh, independence of Australian senators, and do you think that's limited in any way by it, particularly given voting below the line one is required to number, I think, is it 90 per cent? No, we've changed that. You only now have to number, I think, depending on whether it's a half Senate election or a full one, effect up, effectively up to six. Um. Yeah. Um, as I said earlier, historically, at least on my side of politics, the senators displayed a bit more independence than members of the House. Uh, even though they are um, effectively elected on a party list. I mean, I, I, I make the joke to my members, my friends in the lower house, that you know, there's no core flutes of me scaring children outside schools. I mean, you get a degree of anonymity um, a, as a senator that you don't get as a lower house member, where it is a very personal campaign, your photo is everywhere. I'm conscious that, at least for the major parties, most of us are elected on a party vote. Um, but even if you look over the last few years, um, in 2009, my side of politics then in opposition had a very extensive and difficult debate over whether to support the Labor government's proposal for effectively an emissions mm -hmm. trading scheme. Um, and at that time, the dissent to the party line was actually more prominent amongst the Senate uh, because the Senate was the one where the, the, bill was, the fate of the bill was going to be determined. And we eventually determined a party position to oppose it, which ironically only held the wall in the Senate because the Greens voted against it too. Uh, which the Labor Party never ceases to remind them of. Um, so I, I, I take your point, it's just that history seems to have demonstrated the opposite. Even though instinctively you might think being elected as a party list person, you have less freedom. Um, I don't think it's a hard and fast rule, just my observations over a couple of decades. I just want to ask you a question. One of the things that has always struck us in the past about uh, watching procedures in the Australian House of Representatives, not the Senate, is the sort of tone of the discourse, she says, certainly home, home. Yeah, it sounds a bit like a bear pit with everybody rowing at each other and stuff like that. Um, we had some very nasty scenes in Parliament last week, um, tempers quite raised and a very antagonistic sort of atmosphere. I wondered, you know, where you thought sort of, you know, civility in Parliament was going in the Australian part, you know, it, has that all calmed down? Is it now sort of measured? Is it very different in the Senate 
to the sort of tone that we see sometimes with that. We had people punch each other, don't they? There's, do they punch each other in the floor of the Australian? No, we've never no. had. Oh. We've, we've never had physical. Well, I can't say never. In my time, we've not had <laughs> physical altercations. Um, we did have in the last parliament, so before the election, um, in the year leading up to that, a, no, a notable number of instances in the Senate, which were, which required, which led me to make some very strong statements about behaviour and comments. Um, there was one physical altercation between a senator and a chief of staff to another senator. Um, uh, I'll let you Google it all. I don't really want to go through it again. Um, I, I, and I made some statements about behaviour. Um, yeah. it, it hasn't happened again. But mm. there were th there were two or three incidences that were one of them in particular was a, a new parliamentary low. I might say um, Australian politics has always been famously combative. Um, our question time, which to, for those um, who aren't familiar with it, our parliament sits about 20 weeks a year, 18 or 20 weeks a year, from Monday to Thursday. We all fly in from around the country. And on every single one of those days, every minister turns up to question time, including the prime minister, for an hour and a bit from, for, from 2 p.m. Uh, and it, it's not like there's only one session for half an hour a week. And it, it's not as um, what I'd call iterative or spontaneous as the British system. It's very structured. There's a time for a question, it's either a minute or a bit longer. There's four minutes for an answer, and then there's another question, and it goes like that. We, and we do have questions from government members to um, ministers. Um, a cynic might say that the minister can expect what that question will be and will not be too surprised by it. Um, and in both chambers, you have ministers representing every portfolio. So I go into the Senate as a minister, I think I've represented social services and health, and someone else will represent the treasurer, the leader will represent the prime minister. Um, so it is competitive. Um, it is a regular complaint from citizens when they see it. Um, but we haven't had, um, well, the decline in behaviour that occurred in the last 12 months before the election, I think, has stopped. I think. Um, and did you do anything? I mean, does it just revert to normal? Did you and the sort of other, you know, authorities have to well, do things to stop it? I, you know, so our speaker um, can suspend someone from the house for an hour um, just by booting so them out. Sin bin them. Yeah, I don't have that authority, and I don't mm. think I should have it. By mm. the way, it works better in the Senate. Mm. That, that I think that we are dependent upon um, consent. Mm. You know, the speaker has power. I have persuasion, mm. and only one person has been suspended from the Senate in my 11 years mm. there, and I, I did that. I mm. named them, and then a motion was moved to suspend them for the rest mm. of the day, and that was quite contentious. Um, so there's not a lot of power. You've got the power of persuasion mm. in my job, um, as Tony Smith does in the House, because you know you can't kick everyone out. He, he, we both essentially try and wind it back when it gets mm. a little bit too heated. Mm. Um, so I, I made some fairly serious statements to the Senate, mm. and I generally had most people understand that it wasn't reflecting well on any of us. Right, we're coming to our close. I just want to check. Is there a last question? Yes, last question. Uh, yeah, good evening. Uh, my name is David Lewis. I've got a background in property and government. So a slightly different question. Um, here in the UK, we have an absolutely iconic Houses of Parliament, which is completely unfit for purpose. I know that in Australia, you have a pretty modern building, about 30 years old. I just wondered if you had any thoughts about whether the actual premises themselves um, in any way play a part in, in the smooth yeah. operation of politics? Thanks. That is a really interesting mm. question. Um, our parliament was designed in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, and by the time it opened, um, and even now, like we have real issues with energy because it wasn't designed to be a particularly energy efficient building. There's lots of glass, which in summer, you know, you, you, there's a whole range of things. The people who worked in that building in the old parliament house, which was much, much smaller, will tell you that politics the building does change and has changed politics. Um, now, this goes to a point where um, we did have a less diverse series of members of parliament, and without going into too much detail, the old joke was, you know, a minister used to be able to nobbled by a backbencher when they were in the bathroom. Now, mm. because, you know, that, well, you only had male MPs for a long time mm. um, before we got a more greater diversity. So, but that principle of shared space still applies. Um, I think our building, again, I don't want to complain about it, it's a majestic building, it's worth billions of dollars and it costs a fortune for taxpayers to build um, and to, it's expensive to maintain. But I do think having MPs in individual offices with their own bathroom, little kitchenette, um, and ministers in their own wing of the building 
Um, as a minister, I can tell you, compared to when I worked there in the 90s, backbenchers just didn't walk through the ministerial wing and pop in to see ministers as much as they used to. Personally, I think that is one of the things that's happened over 15 years. Ministries have got more distant from their caucus colleagues. I think that has led to problems getting bigger before they get resolved, which could explain some of the internal party tensions. If you come to our Parliament House on the busiest day of the year, which is our budget day, you can still walk down a corridor and not see someone. It is a, a cavernous building. And one of the things we do do, and I'm, we're very aware of this with colleagues, if you're having a bad day in Parliament, you can be away from home, you can be isolated in your office, you can be being beaten up because uh, something went wrong by the media. It can be a very, very lonely place. Um, so I think you can, if you're designing it from scratch, you would provide more public spaces. For example, mm -hmm. there's a big staff calf, one of those huge staff calves, and one coffee shop. And you'd probably have more. You'd probably create those urban spaces that we all like to live in, in villages or town centres, where there's more what I call spontaneous interaction. There's not a lot of spontaneous interaction in our parliament, and I do think that that does shape some of the activities. That said, as a place to get your work done, it is incredibly effective, and the old parliament was like, it was just not fit for purpose because you had three or four MPs in an office, no capacity for staff, the library was half off site. Uh, a whole range of things like that. And you're less likely to get electrocuted or have sewage <laughs> in than our parliament. Though, though I think the sort of space in Portcullis House, actually, I don't know whether you've been yes. there, the, is actually that sort of space yep. where you see, you know, you just walk through it and you see loads of people you know, even if you're someone like me. Um, that's drawing it to a close. But Senator Ryan, thank you so much for Thanks coming. Thanks for having me. And stopping off on your, uh, on your tour, which has included Uganda as well, so that's quite an interesting routing and have a great flight back to Australia tomorrow and thank you very much for doing it and I think actually there's some really interesting very relevant things um, particularly as, as a result of the sort of current impasses in Parliament a lot of these constitutional issues that we tend not to think about most of the time in the UK are really coming back you know, we were talking earlier about electoral reform potentially back on the agenda um, you know the uh, role of the House of Lords, which suffers from its own little legitimacy problems, uh, etc. So I think it's really interesting to hear about how a different Westminster system is working. So could you please all thank Senator Thanks for Ryan. having me.